now we come to the second part of our program and that is question answer session the question answer session would be conducted as follows the mics are there at my left and in my front in the center aisle and there is a mic in the ladies section as well those who want to ask questions may come to these mics and they can ask questions first of all questions that would be asked would be related to the topic except to the non muslim brothers who will have the right to ask any question that they would like to ask the questioner has to give his name and profession the question should be very short and brief without going into any introductory speech that would save time i would especially request our volunteers to ensure that the person who comes to the mic is a non muslim now we begin our question answer session with a mic on my left hand any brother especially non muslim brother who would like to ask a question may feel free to come and ask a question respected naik sir my name is uh, v balasubramaniam i would like to ask a question what is the definition of sin in islam what are the various kinds of sins how is this definition different from that given in hinduism christianity and other religions thank you the brother asked the question that what is the definition of sin in islam and how does it differ from the definition in hinduism and christianity in short sin means disobeying the commandment of almighty god if whatever almighty god says and if you go against it it's a sin for example almighty god says that you should pray if you don't pray you are doing a sin if almighty god says don't have alcohol and if you have alcohol you are doing a sin so disobeying the commandment of almighty god in short is a sin and this sin has a similar definition in all the religions including hinduism and christianity hope that answers the question question from the center mic please dr sakir naik i am jerry thomas i am a research scholar in journalism at the usmania university and i have i we and our friends run a site called sakshitimes.com i have questions to you one i always knew that quran is incomplete without hadith now you are referring to other scriptures also since you have referred to bible bible says anybody who denies jesus christ he is the spirit of anti christ that is a prophecy and i also know that hadith says that muhammad had diabolical inspiration what should i conclude from this so with us a question in which he has mentioned a few sentences he said that he knows that the quran is incomplete without the hadith and now he has heard other scriptures also that means if i quote the bible that means i have to follow the bible and he says the bible says anyone who does not believe and deny jesus christ peace be upon him will go to hell etc etc so what are my comments point number 1 the quran is not incomplete without the hadith the quran is complete by itself but to understand the quran you have to go to the commentary of the quran the commentary of the quran is the hadith that is the authentic saying of prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam the quran by itself is a complete book alhamdulillah by itself but if you want commentary in more details about it then you refer to the sayings the authentic sayings of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam which we call as sahih hadith now just because i quoted the other scriptures that does not mean i agree that all the other scriptures are the word of god please don't misunderstand me i was using the strategy of the quran allah says in the quran in surah al imran chapter 3 verse number 64 ta'ala ila qalmitin sawa in bayna baynakum come to common terms as between us and you we are coming to common terms Allah says in the Quran in Surah Rad chapter number 13 verse number 38 wali kulli qaumin had and in every age have we sent a revelation Allah sent several revelations several books by name 
Only four are mentioned in the Quran. The Torah, the Zabur, the Injil, and the Quran. The Torah is the Wahi, the revelation which was given to Moses, peace be upon him. The Zabur is the Wahi, the revelation which was given to David, peace be upon him. The Injil is the Wahi, the revelation which was given to Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. And Quran is the last and final revelation which was given to the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Now, since all the previous revelations came only for a particular group of people and they were meant to be followed in totality for a particular time period, Almighty God did not think it fit to preserve it in pristine purity. But because Quran was the last and final revelation, Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Hijr, chapter number 15, verse number 9, we have revealed the Quran and we shall guard it from corruption. So Quran is the only religious book on the face of the earth which is in its pure form. I'm not saying that. Even the scholars of comparative religion, including William Moore, who is one of the staunchest critics of Islam, being a Christian, he said 200 years earlier that there is no religious book. There is no religious book which has maintained its pure form for more than 1200 years. Now it is more than 1400 years like the Quran. Being a Christian, being a staunchest critic of Islam, he has to be truthful that Quran is pure form. Now all the other religious scriptures have changed its form, including the Bible. I don't consider the Bible to be the word of God. We Muslims believe in the Wahi which was given to Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, the Injil. But the present Bible that we have, brother, this Bible, it's a mixture. It may contain words of God which match with the Quran. I've got no problem in accepting it to the word of God. It also contains the words of the prophets. It contains the word of historians. I'm sorry to say it even contains pornography. I can't quote it here. I can't. It even contains hundreds of contradictions, scientific errors, mathematical errors, which I can't repeat here. But I had a dialogue with Dr. William Campbell. He wrote a book against Islam, the Quran and the Bible in the light of history and science. And he said, the Quran has got 30 scientific errors. I went to USA. He's from Philadelphia, and we had a debate in the year 2000, 1st April, on the topic, the Quran and the Bible in light of science. And I answered to all his allegations. And when I pointed out 38 contradictions in the Bible, he could not reply to them. <laughs> Allah says in the Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 79, Allah says, فَوَيْلُوا لِلَّذِينَ يَكْتُبُونَ الْكِتَابَ بِأَيْدِهِمْ سُمَّا يَقُلُونَ هَذَا مِنْ إِنْدِ اللَّهِ لِيَشْتَرُوا بِهِ سَمْنًا كَلِيلًا Woe to those who write the book with their own hands and then say this is from Allah. To traffic with it for a miserable price, woe to those for what they write, woe to those for what they earn. So today's Bible, if you know, the word Bible is not there in the Bible. It comes from the Greek word biblos, meaning a book of books. And the scholars say there are many authors of the Bible, not I the Christian scholar. So the present Bible, I don't consider it to be the word of God. Similarly, if you ask me, can you consider the Veda to be the word of God? Can you consider the Buddhist scripture to be the word of God? Can you consider the Parsi script word of God? What I say. Maybe they were, maybe they were not. Since there were many scriptures sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, many books, by name four are mentioned. But there were many other like Sufi, Ibrahim, several others. So what I say, maybe, Hindu scriptures, maybe word of God. Maybe Buddhist scriptures, maybe word of God. Maybe Parsi scriptures were the word of God. But even if they were, they were meant for those people and for that time. Today, you have to follow the last and final revelation. That is the glorious Quran. So any human being, whether you're living in India, in America, in Canada, in UK, in Singapore, in Saudi Arabia, all the human beings in the world should follow the last and final revelation, the glorious Quran, and the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. I am not saying Hindu scripture is the word of God. Even if it was, it was meant for those people and for that time. The Hindu scholars agree that the scriptures have been changed. The Buddhist scholars agree that Buddhist scriptures have been changed. All the scholars of their own religion except Islam, they agree that the scriptures have gone changes down the line, down the ages. But even if I agree for sake of argument, it is the word of God. Even if it's, since the followers of that religion, 
they believe it to be the word of God, they should follow every letter, every word of the scripture. So if the Buddhists believe their scripture word of God, the Hindus believe their scripture to be the word of God, the Christians believe their scripture word of God, so all your scriptures are saying you have to follow the teachings of the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So since you consider it to be the word of God, I say maybe it is, maybe it is not. Since you believe it to be the word of God, you have to follow your scriptures. So you have to believe in the last and final messenger. As I mentioned in the Bible, in the Gospel of John, chapter number 16, verse number 12 to 14, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, says, I have many things to say unto you, but he cannot bear them now. For he, when the spirit of truth shall come, he shall guide you unto all truth. He shall not speak of himself. All that he hears shall he speak. He shall show you things to come. He shall glorify me. Who is this person? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa was there any religious person who has glorified Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, besides Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa You rightly said that anyone who denies Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, will go to hell. You said. I agree with that statement. I agree. No Muslim is a Muslim if he does not believe in Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. And we have to say peace be upon him. You may say Jesus. I cannot say. I have to say peace be upon him. If I as a religious person, if I do not add peace be upon him. I'll be kicked out. A layman can do that. I have to add peace be upon him. So, no Muslim is a Muslim if he does not believe in Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. We believe that he was one of the mightiest messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We believe that he was born miraculously without any male intervention, which many modern Christians do not believe. We believe that he gave life to the dead with God's permission. We believe that he healed those born blind and lepers with God's permission. The Muslim and the Christians are going together. But I know what you mean. When you mean, believe in Jesus Christ, you mean? What do you mean? Believe is God, correct? Can you on the microphone? When you say believe in Jesus Christ, means what? Believe is the prophet? I believe this statement that I am the way, the truth, and the life. What does it mean? It means that he is the incarnate God. Brother has... Follow this question. John chapter, the same. I will give you the reference. I'll give you the reference also, no problem. <laughs> what is the reference? John chapter 14, you can refer. Verse number. I have the Bible, I can tell you. John chapter 14, verse 16. So not 16, Sorry, verse Mr. number 6, it's not 16. Sorry, Mr. Nayak, you don't have to teach me Bible. You just tell whatever. Your misrepresentations will be answered in our sight. Thank That's you. right. Brother, you are not quoting, you have the Bible in your bag, correct? You take out the Bible from your bag and you're quoting Gospel of John, chapter number 14, verse number 6, it's not 16. <laughs> and you said that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he said that he was God. I'll come to your question. Before I come to your question, let me tell you one thing. I've read the Bible. There is not a single unequivocal statement in the complete Bible where Jesus Christ, peace be upon himself, says that I am God or where he says worship me. If any Christian can point out to me a single unequivocal statement, a single unambiguous statement in the complete Bible where Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, himself says that I am God or where he says worship me, I am ready to accept Christianity today. I am not speaking on behalf of my other Muslim brothers. I am putting my head on the guillotine. I am a student of compiled religion. You have read the Bible. Even I have studied the Bible. You say that I should not teach you the Bible. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, says, Seek ye the truth, and the truth shall free you. I will, inshallah, show you the truth, and the truth shall free you today, inshallah. As I mentioned earlier, there is not a single unequivocal statement in the complete Bible where Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, himself says that I am God or where he says worship me. In fact, if you read the Bible, Jesus Christ, peace be upon himself says, it's mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 14, verse number 28. He said, my father is greater than I. Gospel of John, chapter number 10, verse number 29, my father is greater than all. Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 12, verse number 28. I cast out devils with the Spirit of God. Gospel of Luke, chapter number 11, verse number 20. I, with the finger of God, cast out devils. Gospel of John, chapter number 5, verse number 30. I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just. For I seek not my will, but the will of my Father. Anyone who says I seek not my will, the will of Almighty God, is a Muslim.
Jesus Christ, peace be upon the Muslim. He never claimed divinity. It's clearly mentioned in the book of Acts, chapter number 2, verse number 22. It says that ye men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God amongst you by wonders and miracles and signs which God did by him and you are witness to it. A man approved of God amongst you by wonders and miracles and signs which God did by him and you are witness to it. So the Bible clearly said that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was a man. He was one of the mightiest messengers of God, but not God. There is not a single unequivocal statement in the complete Bible where Jesus Christ, peace be upon himself, says that I am God, or where he says, worship me. You quoted a verse to prove your point. From Gospel of John, chapter number 14, verse number 6, which says, where Jesus Christ, peace be upon himself, says that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto my Father, but through me. Now, this is again quoting out of context. People pick up verses from the Quran and quote out of context to malign. Similarly, Christian missionaries quote the Bible out of context. I want to tell you a truth to you. You can open the Bible, if you doubt me. Open the Bible. For the context, go to verse number 1. Gospel of John, chapter number 14, verse number 1 says that, Why are you afraid? Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, says, If you have faith in God, have faith in me. In my father's mansion, there are many houses, and I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And when I go, I will tell you. So Thomas asked, where thou art going? He said, don't you know where I go? He said, no. Then he says that, show us the way, where thou goest. So then Jesus Christ, peace be upon replies, I am the way, the truth, and the life. When Thomas asked, Jesus Christ, peace be upon show us the way to God. Then Jesus Christ, peace be upon replies, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto thy father but through me. We agree at the time of the messenger. Every messenger was the way, the truth, and the life. No man came unto God but through the way of that messenger. At the time of Jesus, I agree with the Bible that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he was the way, the truth, and the life. No man came unto Almighty God but through the teachings of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. At the time of Moses, Moses was the way, the truth, and the life. No man came unto Almighty God, but through the teachings of Moses, peace be upon him. But today, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, I have many things to say unto you. Further, he says, in the Gospel of John, chapter number 16, verse number 12 to 14, I have many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. For he, when the spirit of truth shall come, he shall guide you unto all truth. He shall not speak of himself. All that he hears shall he speak. He shall show you things to come. He shall glorify me. At today's time, at today's time, the messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to Almighty God but through the teachings of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Since Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the last and final messenger, in today's age, irrespective of whether a person is living in USA, in Canada, in UK, in India, in Saudi Arabia, any part of the world, for every human being today, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto Almighty God, but through the teachings of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And this is what all the major scriptures say, including the Bible. So hope now you have been enlightened to the truth, and hope, inshallah, you will come to the truth, and truth shall free you. Now the question will come from the sister's section. If any non-Muslim sister is there, Please come to the mic and ask her the question. Good evening, sir. I'm a lecturer by profession and also a research scholar in Islam and comparative studies. May I know your name, please? I'm Nilima. I respect your great enlightenment, sir, but I have a small qualification to be made. Like, uh, let us go back to the Bhavishya Purana, Part 3, Khan 3, Adhyay 3, and Slokas 5 to 8. Uh, before going to this, I would just like to mention that Maybe you already know, because every prophet who comes in the name of God will fulfill the prophecy which is made for him. So any prophet who fulfills 50% of that prophecy is not qualified to be a prophet. I mean, this is a simple logical thing. So now coming back to the Bhavishya Purana, you talked about the Malaysia leader saying that he is none other than Muhammad. Okay. Now, I accept the first half of the thing, of the sloka you said, but the second 50%, which is still ignored. Now, sir, let me tell you, 
Mlecha, the word meaning Mlecha, it is derived from Sanskrit dictionary, I mean the meaning, and the meaning means non-Aryan or sinner or wicked person. These are the three different meanings given to the word Mlecha. So according to this, can Muhammad be a sinner or a wicked person? The second part is, the second condition of the prophecy is that he will belong to Marusthal and in Sanskrit, land of death. Because Maru, I mean it is derived from Sanskrit, Mru. Mru is death. And definitely it does not quoting to the land of Arabia because it is a barren land or it is a battlefield. And next, coming to the third point of faith, this prophecy also mentions that that nature leader will take bath in Panchagavya and in river Ganges. And it is a common truth, we know that Ganges means Ganga river and we all know that Ganga is not in Arabia but it is in India. It is a universal fact. And coming to the taking bath in Panchagavya, the meaning of Panchagavya is five products of cow. And the products of cow is milk, curds, ghee, urine, cow dung. And now sir, coming to this part exclusively, this prophecy must be fulfilled by Muhammad wherein if you show me at least single reference from Quran wherein Muhammad has taken bath in either in all these five products that is milk, curds, ghee, urine and cow dung, I'm ready to accept Islam today. Thank you, sir. Sister has rightly said that if the prophecy that you give if more than 50% is not fulfilled, then the prophecy is wrong. I agree with you, sister. I agree with you. And I will answer all your three queries. Let's see whether you accept Islam or not today. <laughs> That's a different thing that you may not agree with the truth. I will speak to you. I agree with you. Malaysia, I agree with you, all your three definitions. Malaysia, one of the meaning is non-Aryan, meaning a foreigner. One of the meaning is sinner, one is a wicked person. That's the reason, like the Hindus, they call the Muslims as Malaysia. When they say that, they mean actually wicked and sinner. But the other meaning is also foreigner. As far as when I speak, when I quote from any scripture, while quoting and while taking the meaning, it's not necessary that if the word has got four meanings, then more than two meanings should be correct. No. Even if one is correct, the meaning is right. For example, the Quran says that don't have pig. Today, if you open the dictionary, one of the slang meanings for pig is a cop, means a policeman. So one meaning is pig. The other meaning is a policeman. But naturally, the Quran and the Bible, when the Bible says in the book of Leviticus, chapter number 11, verse number 7 and 8, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 14, verse number 8, and the book of Isaiah, chapter number 65, verse number 2 and 5, when it says, don't have pig, it doesn't mean don't have a policeman. <laughs> if you're a student of comparative religion, if there are 10 meanings, even if one is correct, you have to choose the right one. Two may be correct, three may be correct, all 10 may be correct. But even if one is correct out of 10, it can fulfill the prophecy. So here I agree with you, sister. Malaysia does mean non-Aryan. To Indian, it will be a foreigner. And I said in my speech when I translated, a Malaysia means a foreigner. Now you want to go in the wrong way and say Malaysia means wicked here. That is a misunderstanding, sister. If you say the Bible says and the Quran says don't have a policeman, that means you're not a student of comparative religion. You are a novice. If any one of the meanings fulfills the prophecy, one more thing, if there's a doubt, there are 10 points I mentioned, all the others can't be refuted. Your second meaning, marustal. One of the marustal, I do agree, mar means death, but the other meaning of marustal in Sanskrit is a sandy track. You go back to the dictionary today and open. In our Islamic Research Foundation, we have a Sanskrit dictionary also, sister. I am a student of comparative religion. I do agree, one is a place of death, the other is a sandy track. So why are you taking the wrong meaning? That means you are going out of the way. So if you see the permutation and combination, all the other points I mentioned are 100% correct. Here also, you have to choose the right meaning. So one of the meanings of Marustal means a sandy track or a desert. Coming to your third question. And you accepting Islam, inshallah. 
The third question that I mentioned in the prophecy that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam took a bath in the Panch Garv, in the Ganges. Now here we analyze that when we say in the Hindu terminology, when you say bath in the Panch Garv, in the Ganges, it means to purify. One means actually you dip yourself in the Ganges, which I don't expect the Prophet came and dipped himself in the Ganges. It means to purify. I did not give the explanation because the lecture is very long. I can speak on this topic for the full day. I did not give details of everything. I can speak on each prophecy for another few minutes, even for us together. So here, having a bath in the Panch Garv means purify. So depending upon the context, it doesn't mean a physical bath. And even if you physically have a bath in the Panch Garv, in the Ganges, not necessarily you'll be purified. It is the philosophy of the Hinduism. So here, when the prophecy says, that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, had a bath in the Panch Garf. It doesn't mean he came here in the Ganges. It means that he was purified by Almighty God. And we believe that all the prophets of God, all, whether it be Moses, Jesus Christ, peace be upon them, and Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, all of them were masoom. They were innocent. They were pure. So all the prophets of God, of Almighty God, which he sent down, all of them we consider to be innocent, to be masoom, to be pure. So this answers the question, and I hope, inshallah, you'll accept Islam, sister. Now, question from the mic on my left-hand side. My name is Prem Advani. I am from New Delhi, a retired senior citizen, non-Muslim. My question is that Islam, with a glorious past, should continue to be more glorious with a present time. I wish that the Muslims should give more transparency and access to what activities are being conducted from the grassroots level of madrasas and masjids and so on, so that the people should feel what is going on. The truth should be uh, transparent. My, my main aim is transparency. Thank you. You have asked a very good question. Before you answer the question, I would just like to throw some light. The sister had asked an early question, three questions. And that reminds me that my daughter, who had come last, she had said a song, don't talk to me about Muhammad, you know? Peace be upon him. And the coordinator said, please pay attention to the words, what she's saying. And if you heard the words carefully, it's the seerat of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that once when Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was going, he finds a companion as a stranger. She starts speaking against the Prophet. Oh, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is a bad person, don't talk to me. She's telling Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that person doesn't know the person is talking to. She tells to the stranger, that person on the road, that Prophet Muhammad is bad, don't listen to him, he causes disharmony, he teaches only about one God, blah, blah, blah. That's what my daughter was saying in that song. Later on, but she says, oh, you are a very good person. But I'm warning you, don't listen to that man, Muhammad. Peace be upon him. He's a rogue. Knows Billah. He's a very bad person, knows Billah, and so on and so forth. But she says, you are a very good person. You are so kind, you are so loving. Please, may I know your name? Then she says, pardon? What did you say? Am I incorrect? Your name is Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa Then she says, ashadu Allah, ilaha illallah, wa ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. So when the traveler realizes, that this person is actually Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. I have heard from other people that he's the wrong person. This person is so good, she immediately accepts Islam. So our dear sister, when she posed so many questions again, I thought it reminds me of my daughter when she was narrating the seerah of the Prophet in that song, the person, the travel attacking Islam, attacking the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But when she comes to know the truth, she says the shahada. So inshallah, our dear sister also will share the shada. And I really ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to open a heart. Our dear brother here asked a very good question. He agrees that Islam had a glorious past. But he says that there should be transparency, especially in the madrasa. Who says no? I'm for you, brother. I'm fully for you. Who says there should be no transparency? Not transparency. I want the non-Muslims to come and study in this madrasa. I'm aware, brother, I'm aware what you're talking about the media. That the media is saying that madrasas are the schools of terrorism. Media says, not you, brother, media. Madrasa in Arabic means a place of dars, somewhat like a university. You can call it a school, 
call it a college or call it a university. But the media portrays as though, you know, if you go to a madrasa, you'll become a terrorist. Media portrays, not you. I am asking, number one person who has killed maximum human beings in the world is Hitler. Which madrasa did he go to? Which madrasa? Which madrasa he went to? See, today, you know, mafia, the top people in the world from Italy and all these smugglers, if you take a survey that all the smugglers, all the top people that go to the jail, if you take a survey, how many people go to madrasa? How many? A small, maybe, maybe a couple of percent. Majority go to universities. Which university? Modern university. Schools, colleges. So can I say that you should close the school? Can I say close the College of Education, close BA, close BCom, close BSc? No. Because I know I have studied in the school. That school doesn't say that you should drop or you should smuggle. You should go against your country. It is they study in that school, but they are the black sheep of that school. So Hitler also may have gone to the modern education. I'm sure that the school he went to didn't teach him that you should kill six million Jews. So what we realize that these are black sheep. So as a whole, you know, every year in this country, there are thousands of people who are passing from Madrasas, from Nadwa, from Deoban, thousands of them. So do you say that they're going and killing people? They're not at all. It is the media which portrays. And now the government wants to go. And last year or year before last, they went to Nadwa, imagine. They went to Nadwa and they wanted a search warrant they took out to check. To check what? And Alimi and Nadvi, Rahimullah, he said, okay, come forward, check. What they found? Nothing. See, once in a blue moon, one in a lakh, one in a hundred thousand, one in a million, maybe a person after he passed the madrasa may have been misled. That doesn't mean madrasa teaches that. But a bigger percentage of the students studying from schools, modern education, from colleges, from university, which we get degrees of BA, BCom, engineering, doctor, more of the people doing wrong activities and evil activities. So as far as transparency, brother, I'm for it. No madrasa will ever say that you do not come and check. Our syllabus is open. Even our school. In our school, we are teaching, mashallah, we are teaching comparative studies. My student from my school knows more about Hinduism than average Hindu. He knows more about Christianity than average Christian. He knows more about Islam than an average Muslim because we pay attention to both of them. So as far as transparency, brother, is concerned, I'm for you, I'm with you, and no one will ever say that you don't come and analyze. Come, but don't blame. Don't come with a negative mind. Come with open mind. You may never know, you may get hidayah. You may come to the truth. Yes, brother. Create an atmosphere of encouragement for non-Muslims to come and learn something and see for themselves. That is what I mean by transparency, so that people should not have suspicion that something wrong is going on, something good is going on. But you should make it transparent. Brother asked a very good question. We should make it transparent for non-Muslim to come and study. Brother, first invitation I give to you and your children, come to IRF. I give invitation to you. See, Islamic Research Foundation has a library. It is one of the most well-equipped libraries, at least in India, of scriptures of different religions. You know, we have more than 200 different types of Bible, more than 50 versions of the Bible. We have more than 50 translations only of Bhagavad Gita. We have several translations of Vedas, of Rig Ved, Yajur Ved, Tharva Ved. You may not find in the library of your government. You may not find in the library of maybe your school of thought. We encourage, study, and come to the truth. And leave aside others. I give the first invitation to you and to your children. I will even bear the air ticket free. Come to IRF and we welcome you. Study and we will learn the truth together, inshallah. Can you on the microphone? Yes, brother. I wish to thank you that you have taken my suggestion in the right spirit and I will take opportunity to avail of your offer. Thank Please, just write to us, I'll send you an air ticket, inshallah. Yes, brother from the center mic. My name is Ramakrishna. I'm a physiotherapy student. My question is, what is the need of Allah to create Adam and Eve and this total universe, what he will get from this? 
and my second question is everything is created by someone so even god must have been created by someone what is the meaning of allah brother there are three questions the first question why did god create adam and eve and what was his reason to create all this world and human kind allah subhanahu wa taala created adam and eve may peace be upon them both so that the human kind could come they were the great great grandparents allah says in surah hujurat chapter number 49 verse number 13 Ya ayyuhan nasu inna khalaqnakum min dhakrin wa unsa wa ja'alnakum shu'uban wa qaba'ila litarafu inna karamakum min dhalahi atkakum inna la alimun khabir O humankind, we have created you from a single pair of male and female and have divided you into nations and tribes so that you may recognize each other not that you may despise each other and the most honored in the sight of Almighty God is the person who has taqwa the criteria to judge any human being it is not wealth it's not color it's not caste it's not creed it is taqwa it is god consciousness it is righteousness it is piety so adam and eve peace be upon them both they were our great great grandparents of yours also and of mine also all human kind therefore i call you a brother we are brothers in humanity allah says ya you are nas o human kind and allah says in surah isra chapter number 17 verse number 70 wa laqad karamna bani adama Almighty God has honored all the children of Adam whether they are born in India USA UK born in a Hindu family or a Muslim family or a Christian family Allah says he has honored all the bani adam if you are a human being Allah has honored you whether your name is Zakir Abdullah Ramu Shankar if you are born as a human being Allah has honored you now coming to the question why has almighty god created the human beings Allah has created the human beings because Allah says this is one of his best creation all the other creation of Allah subhanahu wa taala they obey him we have the angels whatever almighty god says the angels obey him directly they have no free will the human being is the creation of Allah subhanahu wa taala which has a free will we can either obey him or disobey him so Allah has created such a creation we are one of his best creation in the best of forms but we have a choice of either obeying god or disobeying god If we obey God we will go to jannah we will go to swarg we will go to heaven if we disobey him we will go to hell we will go to nark so this is the test for the hereafter allah says in surah mulk chapter number 67 verse number 2 allazi khalaqal mauta wal hayata it is allah who has created that a life to test which of you is good in deeds so this life is a test for the hereafter so allah has created the human beings and allah says in surah dariyat chapter number 51 verse number 56 وما خلقت الجن والانس الا ليعبدون that we have created the jinn and the men not but to worship him so we supposed to worship obey the commandment of allah subhanahu wa taala so this is the different creation of allah subhanahu wa taala which has the free will of even going against allah subhanahu wa taala or obeying him all the other things the stars the trees the mountains the quran says they do sajda to allah subhanahu wa taala they prostrate to him they obey him we have a free will Now when Allah has given a free will with the free will if we obey him we become higher than the angels with the free will if we disobey him we become the partners of the devil so he's created us for the test for the hereafter come to your second question everything has a creator who created god if anyone says everything has a creator it is a wrong statement every created thing has a creator the definition of god is he is uncreated the moment you say who created god he is not god the definition of god is he is uncreated suppose a person comes and asks you that brother my friend john he was admitted in the hospital he gave birth to a child can you guess was it a girl or a boy can you guess try it out guess can't guess why can you on the microphone can you guess was it a girl or a boy ha huh? see brother john he was admitted in the hospital he gave birth to a child was it a girl or a boy can you guess a 50 50% chance girl or boy people are laughing why can you guess can't guess why even if you guess can you get the answer right Okay, can you guess? I'll give you two chances. Was it a girl or a boy? <laughs> Try it out. Girl. girl. 
Brother, can a man give birth to a child? Ah, there you made a mistake. Same way you made a mistake by asking who created God. A man cannot give birth to a child. So where's the question of it being girl or a boy? See, now you understood. Ah, now that's good, brother. So it was a man cannot give birth to a child. So where's the question of a girl or a boy? So when you're asking who created God, God by definition, Allah by definition is uncreated. The moment you say who created Allah, he's not Allah. There's nothing like him. Coming to your last part of the question, who is Allah? Who is Allah? The best definition I can give you is quote to you Surah Ikhlas. Chapter number 112, verse number 1 to 4. It's mentioned in the Quran, Kul ho Allah ho ahad. Say he is Allah one and only. Allah ho samad. Allah the absolute and eternal. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. He begets not nor is he begotten. Wa lam yakul lahu kuffan ad. There's nothing like him. This is a four line definition of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Any human being, any person says so and so candidate is God. If that candidate fits in this four line definition, we Muslims have got no objection in accepting that candidate as God. Four line definition. This is the litmus test for theology, for the study of God. First is, Qul hu Allah hu ahad. Say he's Allah one and only. Allah hu samad. Allah the absolute and eternal. Lam yulad wa lam yulad. He begets not nor is he begotten. Wa lam yakul lahu kufana. There's nothing like him. If you go to the Hindu scriptures, the same is mentioned in the Hindu scriptures. Qul wa Allah wad is mentioned if you read Chandogya Upanishad. Chapter number 6, section number 2, verse number 1. Ikkam evidityam. God is only one without a second. Second test. Allah is Samad. Allah the absolute and eternal. Bhagavad Gita chapter number 10 verse number 3 says, I am known as the Lord of all the worlds, the unbegotten, the beginningless. Third test, Lam yulad wa lam yulad. He begets not nor is he begotten. It's mentioned in the Shweta Shatara Upanishad. Chapter number 6 verse number 9. Nachas ye kasij, janita na chadipa. Of him there are no lords, he has got no parents. Almighty God has got no father, he has got no mother. And Valam Yakulla Ukufanad, there's nothing like him, is mentioned in Shweta Shadar Upanishad, chapter number 4, verse number 19, and Yajurved, chapter number 32, verse number 3, where it says, Nathasya Patima Asti. Of that God, there is no Pratima, there is no idol, there is no image, there is no photograph, there is no sculpture. Who says that? Yajurved, chapter number 32, verse number 3. Same as Valam Yakulla Ukufanad. So any person saying so and so candidate is God, if that candidate fits in this four line definition, we Muslims have got no objection in accepting that candidate as God. For example, some people say, Bhagawan Rajneesh is Almighty God. Once during question answer time, a Hindu told me, we don't believe Bhagawan Rajneesh to be God. I never said that the Hindus believe Bhagawan Rajneesh is God. I said some people believe Bhagawan Rajneesh to be God. Let us put this Rajneesh to test. First test is, Kul Wallahu Ahad. Say is Allah one and only. Was Rajnish one and only? Was he the only man who claimed divinity? There are hundreds of them. And in this country, we have thousands of men who have claimed divinity. He's not the only one. But Rajnish Bhakti said, no, no, he's unique. Let's go to the next test. Allah Samad. Allah, the absolute and eternal. Was Rajnish absolute and eternal? We know from his biography, from his autobiography, he was suffering from asthma, from diabetes, from chronic backache. Imagine Almighty God suffering from asthma, diabetes, chronic backache. Third test, Lam Virid Valam Yulad. He begets not noise begotten. Bhagavan Rajnish was born in Madhya Pradesh. He had a father and mother. In 1981, he goes to America, USA. And he takes thousands of Americans for a ride. In the state of Oregon, he starts his center and calls it as Rajnish Puram, his village. Later on, the American government arrests him and put him behind bar. Rajnish says, the American government slow poisoned me. Imagine Almighty God being slow poisoned. In 1985, the American government kicked him out of the country. He comes back to India in the same city, Pune, and he goes back to his center, which is now called as Osho Commune. And if you go to the Samadhi of Rajnish, it is mentioned there on the Samadhi, Bhagwan Rajnish, Osho, never born, never died, but visited the earth from the 11th of December, 1931, to the 19th of January, 1990. Never born, never died, but visited the earth from the 11th of December, 1931, to the 19th of January, 1990. They forgot to mention his samadhi. He was not given visas to 21 countries of the world. <laughs> Almighty God coming in this world to visit the world and requires visas to go to different countries. 
and the archbishop of Greece said, if you don't remove Rajneesh out of this country, we'll burn his house and the house of his disciples. And the last test, is so stringent that no one besides the true almighty God can pass. The moment you can compare God to anything, he's not God. We know Rajneesh, like the human beings, had a beard, one nose, two eyes, two ears, two hands. The moment you can compare God to anything in this world, he is not God. If someone says, Almighty God is thousand times stronger than Anders Schwarzenegger. You have heard the name of Anders Schwarzenegger? Have you heard Anders Schwarzenegger? The person who got the title Mr. World, Mr. Universe. The strongest man in the world, the strongest man in the universe. The moment you can compare God to anyone, whether it be Anders Schwarzenegger, whether it be Dara Singh, whether it be King Kong. Whether it be a thousand times or a million times. The moment you can compare God to anything in this world, He is not God. There is nothing like Him. So this is a four line definition of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala given in the Quran. Whichever God you are worshipping, brother, put that God to the test of Surah class. If that God passes, that is a true God. Otherwise, it's a fake God. Let us have a question from the sister's side, please. A non-Muslim sister should come forward and ask a question, please. Ada, Dr. Zaiknaya Saab, my name is Venkat Amma. I live with a Muslim lady, Sadia Madam, for some years. My question is, you say that no religion doesn't tell you wrong things, you don't do wrong work, and what is the reason for that? You say that all Muslims are accepted for Islam. The sister has asked the question that she lives with a Muslim for several years. When I said that all the religions speak good things, then why do the Muslims ask me to accept Islam? Point number one. I say that all the religions, most of the things they say are good. But Islam, besides speaking good things, shows you a way how to achieve that goodness. And I give the example, all religions say don't rob. Islam says the same, but Islam shows you a way how to achieve a state in which people will not rob. Give zakat, give charity. After that, someone robs, chop off the hand. There will be no robbery, there will be no crime. So in this way, I try to explain that Islam, besides talking about good things, shows you a way how to achieve that state of goodness. Secondly, if I have to say, being a student of compared religion, if you have to follow your Hindu scriptures, assuming you're a Hindu, if you have to follow your Hindu scriptures, if you have to be a good Hindu, your Hindu scriptures say, there is one God. I quoted all these verses in my previous answer. One God. Your scripture says, don't do idol worship. Bhagavad Gita, chapter number 7, verse number 20. All those whose intelligence has been stolen by material desires, they worship demigods, they do idol worship. You have to believe in one God. I said in my lecture today that you have to believe in the Antim Rishi, the Kalki Autar, whose father's name will be Vishnu Yash Abdullah, mother's name shall be Sumati Amina, who will be born in the village of Sambala, Makkah, who will be born to the chief of the village of Sambala, chief of Makkah. He will be a messenger for the whole of humankind. He will get enlightenment at night in a cave. He will go northwards and come back. He will be given eight qualities. He will be a messenger for the whole of humankind. He will ride a horse. He will have a sword in the right hand. He will have four companions. He will be helped by the angels and devtas. On and on and on. Who is this person? If you are a good Hindu, you have to believe in the Dantim Rishi. Otherwise, you are not a good Hindu. If you are a good Hindu, you have to believe in one God. You don't have to do idol worship. Of that God, there is no pratima. There is no idol. There is no image. There is no photograph. There is no sculpture. And I have had dialogues with pandits of Hinduism. With Shankaracharya. Many. And I've quoted this. No Shankaracharya told me, Brother Zakir, you're wrong. No one. I had a dialogue with Shri Shri Ravi Shankar on 21st of January supposed to be the most popular spiritual guru, Art of Living. I told him, the best book on Art of Living is the Glorious Quran. I asked him to join our club of Art of Living. We have 1.3 billion members. 1.3 billion members. I gave him an invitation. If he follows the scriptures, he's supposed to be a scholar of the Vedas, he should come to this. Similarly, sister, when I say that all the other scriptures, even if you agree with the word of God, by the passage of time, they have been changed. Swami Vivekananda says that 99% of the Vedas have been lost. 
whatever one person we have, we have to follow it strictly. Strictly means believe in Nantim Rishi also. So if you follow it strictly, you will have to believe in Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Have to believe in the Quran. And I give you an invitation, sister, to come to this religion of peace so that you can come closer to Almighty God. Question from this mic here, please. It's a great opportunity for this August evening to have a, a valuable, immortal, and moral and religion spiritual lecture. We are all impressed by your way of telling, which is changes the person's attitude. My highest regard, my name is Ramdas, I'm a person officer from Electricity Board. So I got highest regard for Islam. Being a Hindu, I got a highest Islam. I agree with you just now you said that Hinduism never speaks of idol worship. It's unfortunate Hinduism are being misguided by egoistic thoughts of the religious so-called leaders. <laughs> they are deliberately misleading the people. In the same Hindus, they say 90 percent of the Hindus are being misguided, saying that idol worship, idol worship, Vedas, Upanishads never speaks about idol worship. It is only the rule. The rule is the criteria. Rule Khudaki inayat hai. Wo rule ko Christianity mein soul kaite hain. Islam mein rule. Hindus mein atma. It's very unfortunate. The egoistic attitude of the takedas of all religions, whether it is a Muslim, Christianity, or Hindus, they are the egoistic fellows who misguide the humanity, people in general, all over the world. Now, question, my question before you, my beloved, uh, learned, intellectual person, is at the just now, Mr. Divan of the Delhi has rightly pointed out that Islam is a glorious past at every stage. But unfortunately, Islam has come to the laughable stock in the present days of the world. The reason is, the takedos of the Muslims leaders, like Hindu leaders, they are making Ruhani ku pachane mein ande jaisa jire hai. Ye dil ki anke khol khuda ki nuri nur hai. Mar insan anda ban ke jira ha hai. Kya ye sawal bol sakte hai ki suraj एक है हवा को कुछ मजहब नहीं है पानी को कुछ मजहब नहीं है एक हिंदू भाई एक मुसलमान औरत को नहीं खून देता है औरत जी सकती है तो जब जब खून ब्लड अगर दे दिए एक हिंदू और मुसलमान औरत को दिए तो नहीं उन्होंने जान बच गई है क्या है हो सकता है कि ये ये हिंदू ये मुसलमानों को दिए तो इन्हों इस्लाम बन गया दस फर्स्ट क्वेश्चन प्लीज ट्राई टू बने आई एम बनलेजिंग माई क्वेश्चन सेकेंडली खून देने से उन्हें बच जाती हैं तो उन्होंने दिल की दुआ दी थी आ मेरा बेटा मेरा जान बचा है मेरे बेटा ए पॉजिटिव वो पॉजिटिव इज द बी पॉजिटिव इज द ब्लड सो मुसलमान औरत को उसके औलाद का खून नहीं आता है तो इसको बैस के से इंसानियत की पहली चीज़ है इंसान एक मजहब है सो उन्हों बी ग्रुप सगा बेटा का खून टैली नहीं हुआ तो इनो हिंदू ने टैली हुआ दे दिया वो माँ बोलते उस माँ के वास्ते क्या मजहब की जरूरत नहीं है दिस इज फर्स्ट वन इसीलिए आज इंसान नहीं रूहानी को नहीं पहचान रहे आंखें रह के भी अंधे के जैसे जी रहे दिल की आंखें खोले थे खुदा की नूर खुदा को नूर पहचानने में नहीं एक अहम आ रहा है मजहब आ रहा है नफरत की आग में जी रहे इस्लाम से जैसे मोहब्बत फाते आलम असलम सलाम सब उन्होंने मोहब्बत इसलिए सदियों के सालों का हजारों साल के बाद भी नहीं उनकी मोहब्बत फालम से नहीं हर चीज दिस जक़ात है जैस जक़ात इज ए गुड इन इस्लाम चैरिटी हेल्प बीइंग फेलो बीइंग किसी की गरीबी की शादी है तो उसको शादी करो उसकी हज हो जाता है तो इस्लाम का सच्चे वर्चुस विच नो रिजन गॉट इज इट वी एग्री फॉर इट आई टू हॉग्री हैव इट इट्स अ वेरी नाइस वर्चुस अनफॉर्चुनेटली दे इज नो इम्प्लीमेंटेशन इन द रियल लाइफ सो मिस्टर दीवान सेद the mothers are to be transparent let the hindus might be needed ki khuda ki inayat ko pehchanne mein nahi aaj islam barbaad ho raha hai christianity egoism they want to supreme purpose they want to curtail the islam there is a egoistic attitude of christianity hinduism they want for the existence no that so these are all the takedas they are not finding what is roo roo khuda ki inayat hai upanishad mein hai islam mein hai on bible mein je je 
సో ఈ రూకు పచ్చాన్ని విని అందిక చేసి దేరి వై రూహానికి నీ పచ్చాన్ రే సో ఇన్సాన్ జింద లాస్క జేదా జీన పసంద్ కరే క్యా ఇస్లామీ మద్రసా విని రూకు మొహబ్బత్ ఫాతిహం సిక్కేతుని ఈ దునియా విని ఏక్ ఐఎం ఖాయం ని మొహబ్బత్ ఫాతిహం వరల్డ్ ఈజ్ రి వరల్డ్ ఈ రిలిజన్ ఆఫ్ మొహబ్బత్ ఇస్లాం హో సక్త దీ ఇస్ మై ఫస్ట్ క్వశ్చన్ సెకండ్ క్వశ్చన్ సెకండ్ క్వశ్చన్ అండ్ దిస్ ఇస్ మై ఫస్ట్ క్వశ్చన్ రూహానికు నీ పచ్చారే సెకండ్ క్వశ్చన్ ఈజ్ క్యా అవరత్కు నీ ఏక్ బురి నిఘా సే దేఖనా హిందూయిజం హే హిందూయిజం మే అవరత్ కు బురా నిఘా సే దేఖే హే ఇస్లామీ బురా నిఘా సే దేఖ రే క్రిస్టానిటీ మీ దే క్యా అవరత్ సే దునియా బద్దీ అబి జస్ట్ యూ సెట్ టు ఏ యంగ్ మ్యాన్ దట్ మరత్ కు బచ్చా పైదా హో సక్త హే అని నో మన్ మ్యాన్ కెన్ నాట్ గివ్ బర్త్ టు యు చైల్డ్ ఇట్ ఈస్ ఏ మదర్ ఇట్ ఈస్ ఏ లేడీ విచ్ గివ్స్ బర్త్ టు ది వరల్డ్ స్టార్టర్స్ విత్ లేడ్ అవరత్ నే జన్మ దియా మరత్ కు మరత్ ఉసె బాజార్ దే రహా चाहे हिंदू हो क्रिश्चियन हो मुस्लिम इस्लाम हो सो so, आज इतनी हर मजहब नहीं बर्बादी के ओर चल रहा है इसको बोलते हैं दो कलयुग बोले बिना कल की अवतार बोलते हैं सो ऑल ऑल डूम्स डे इन क्रिश्चियनिटी इन कलयुग में ख़त्म होने की दें उर्दू में नहीं खयामत के दिन है ये खयामत के दिन में नहीं औरत को ने औरत ना एक पवित्रता था नहीं समझे सो so, ఏక అయ్యాసి కానీ అయ్యాసి కరే హర్ మజబ్ వచ్చి అవరత్ కు బురి నిఘా సే దేఖ రే ఆ దిస్ ఇస్ సెకండ్ క్వశ్చన్ క్యా ఇస్లాం జో ఖయామత్ కే దిన్ యా కలియుగ్ కే దిన్ యా డూమ్స్ డే మే నీ క్యా ఇస్లాం నే ఈ చీజ్ కు క్యా కబుల్ దే సక్తి ఇస్లే మదర్సా మే నీ ఈ అవరత్ కు నీ మొహబ్బత్ ఫాతి ఆలం మా కా జైసా దునియా బంతి రూహానిక పచ్చానో మొహబ్బత్ కానీ అయ్యాసి కో బంద్ కరో సెకండ్ క్వశ్చన్ ఫస్ట్ ఈ రూహానికు నీ పచ్చాన్ రే సో ఏ అంద జిన్సా నీ జిందా రే కే బి నీ అంది కే జైసా కై కు జీ రే mohabbat fate alam rohani i'll answer your question brother you have asked a question i have got your question brother thank you for your that you will give that i am writing a book khuda ki inayat ko pehchano i am writing to the a question to the world all religious khuda ki inayat ko pehchano why this was thank you brother for a very short speech <laughs> and thank you for the good words you spoke about me and about islam as far as i am concerned all praise are due to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone you called me a scholar you called me a knowledgeable person i am just a student i consider myself to be a student on islam and compiled religion you posed two questions one on ru and then on women before that you made certain statement you said that most of the religious take it are causing problems majority i do agree with you then you also went and said that islam is being maligned because the religious leaders of islam they are causing a bad name for islam as far as the religious leaders of the other communities they prevent their followers to read the scripture and do research as far as islam is concerned as a whole i don't blame the religious scholars of islam the religious leaders there are a few black sheep very few there are a very small number of so called religious scholars who are misleading but there are a very small percentage the media picks them up and portrays as though every islamic religious scholar is like that therefore as far as islamic religious scholars are concerned ulama are concerned we love them we respect them there are a few people a very small percentage who do take advantage and misguide the people but as a whole as a whole alhamdulillah they speak the good things they talk about the religion we love them we respect them in contrast to other religions most of the other religious readers of the other religions they don't do that they prevent the followers from reading the scriptures like you rightly said hinduism condemns idol worship etc but more than 90% are doing idol worship because they don't want their followers to read the scriptures coming to your question you said that if a hindu give a blood to a muslim the muslim life is saved main thing is rohani so where is the mazhab does the person become a hindu or if a muslim gives birth to a hindu does he become a muslim allah says in the quran in surah maida chapter number 5 verse number 32 if anyone saves any other human being if any person whether muslim or non muslim saves any other human being whether muslim or non muslim it is as though he has saved the whole of humanity so if any human being gives a blood to any other human being and saves the life whether muslim gives to a hindu or a hindu gives to a muslim that person has saved the whole of humanity the ayat for the save if anyone kills any other human being unless it be for murder 
of creating corruption in the land, it is as though he has killed the whole of humanity. But saving a life of a human being is very good. It's a good deed, very high deed. But the earlier question posed was, why has God created us? I told you earlier, Allah says in Surah Mulk, chapter number 6 and verse number 2, Allah khalaqal mawta wal hayata. It is Allah who has created death and life to test which of you is good in deeds. Saving someone's life is a very great deed. But saving someone's akhira, next life, is a bigger deed. That's the reason I, I was a doctor, supposed to be the best profession, saving human lives. I chose to be a doctor because I thought it was the most noblest profession. It is. But I found a nobler profession. Allah says in Surah Fusilat, chapter number 41, verse number 33, Waman hasunu kala mimman doil Allahi, wa amira salihaun, wa kala inna nimra muslimin. Who is better in speech than one who invites people to the way of thy Lord, who does righteous deeds, and says that I am the one who submit my will to Almighty God? So I changed from being a doctor of a body to a doctor of a soul, which is a better profession. So giving someone blood and saving in life is good but giving someone the truth and saving in akhira is better he said that let's follow what is common so all religions speak about prophet muhammad so quran speaks about prophet muhammad so what is unique very good question all the other religions say that there will be a prophet to come later on as the bible says you being a christian and a student of the Bible, I believe, in the Gospel of John, chapter number 16, verse number 12 to 14, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, I have many things to tell you, but he cannot bear them now. For he, when the spirit of truth shall come, he shall guide you unto all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, all that he hear shall he say. He shall show you things to come. He shall glorify me. That means all the scripture, Hindu scriptures, Parsi scriptures, Buddhist scriptures, Jewish scriptures, Christian scriptures, talking about a prophet to come, a prophet to come, a prophet to come. But Quran says, this is the prophet on whom the Quran is revealed. The prophet has come. When you study standard one, in the school, the ultimate is standard 10. When you go to standard second, ultimate is standard 10. When you go to standard three, standard 10 is ultimate as far as the school is concerned. Standard 5, Standard 6, Standard 7, Standard 8, Standard 9. Now you reach Standard 10 and then you give the SSE examination, correct? That doesn't mean what you learn in Standard 1 is the same in Standard 10. You are getting prepared for Standard 10. So once you're prepared, 1400 years ago, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Almighty God, as Jesus Christ said, I have many things to say unto you. He cannot bear them now. For he, when the spirit of truth shall come, he shall guide you unto all truth. So, 1400 years back, Almighty God, our Creator, thought it fit. Now, the human beings can take this final message. That is the Quran. In all the other scriptures, the basic message of Tawheed, the oneness of God, is the same. The minute details may differ. All the scriptures say about one God, you have to believe in prophets and the final prophet Muhammad. But the basic is the same, the details may differ. But Allah says in Surah Maida, chapter 5, verse number 3, On this day have I perfected my religion for you, have chosen for you Islam, and perfected my favor on you. That is the humankind. After the Quran has been revealed, nothing new can be added, nothing can be subtracted. As I mentioned earlier, if there's something like the Old Testament and the New Testament, the glorious Quran is the last testament. So what is different is, this tells you the ultimate version, the final testament of Almighty God. So if there's an Old Testament and New Testament, the glorious Quran is the last testament. All these religions, they're pointing finger to the same book, the glorious Quran, the same messenger prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Other religions speak about prophet Muhammad to come. Islam teaches you what Allah has revealed on prophet Muhammad and what has he mentioned in the hadith. So this is the final culmination for the whole of humankind. From Adam alayhi salam, Adam, peace be upon him, Till the last day, till today, and till the last day. All of these are talking about that same one God, talking about the last messenger to come. So finally, they have to accept it. And you have to accept the message and implement it. Then only will you be a true Christian. Therefore, I say, I've given a talk on similarities between Islam and Christianity. And I've proved that we Muslims are more Christian than the Christians themselves. Because if we analyze, we follow more teachings of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, than the Christians themselves. You can refer to my video cassette, similarities between Islam and Christianity.
Question from the sister section, please. Uh, brother, I am Susan, and I am a Bible student. And my question is, in your lecture, you said that about the death of the prophets, and in that Moses and Muhammad are of a natural death. And I came across the Quran that Muhammad was given poison from one of his wife. And uh, she gives in such a way that if he is a right prophet, he must be able to discern that he has been given that poison. Sister said that I said Prophet Muhammad that the natural death peace be upon him. But she knows that the Quran mentioned that one of his wives gave poison. Sister, here is the Quran. I challenge you to show any verse in the Quran which says that one of his wives gave poison. <laughs> Nowhere does the Quran say one of his wives gave poison. There's no such verse like that. Maybe where you're getting this from, check your source. Whoever has told you, ask him for proof. See, whatever I said, sister, I gave references. Chapter number, verse number, chapter number, verse number, chapter number, verse number. I quoted the name of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the Vedas. I can again repeat in Hindu scriptures, Christian scriptures. I gave references why? So that you can go home and check. If you think I'm pulling a fast one, you can go and check. Where is the reference? I challenge you to show me in anywhere in the Quran, in any one of the 114 surahs, nowhere it is mentioned, someone is misleading you, sister. Hope that answers the question. Question from the mic here, please. My name is Vinay Kumar. I am an artist. I am a painter. And uh, I want to ask one question, that in your website, you give two reasons why Muhammad could not have copied from the Holy Bible or from the other pre-existing sources. So you gave answer that you claim that there were no Arabic translations of the Bible during the time of Muhammad. But in Sayyid al-Bukhari, volume number 6 and book number 60, number 478, it says that the gospel has already been translated into Arabic by uh, Waraka. And also, second thing is, you said Muhammad was illiterate and therefore couldn't have read books such as the Holy Bible. But I'm not satisfied with that answer because it wasn't necessary for Muhammad to be illiterate in order to borrow stories from previous scriptures. Muhammad only needed to hear these stories orally for borrowing to take place. After hearing these stories, Muhammad uh, revised then and uh, he wrote the theological pre-assumptions and then tried to pass them off as revelation from God. The brother asked a very good question. He goes to the website, so I'm happy about that. Inshallah, he'll come to the truth. And I believe you're a Christian. Your name is Vinay Kumar. You're a Christian, I believe. And brother said, I give two reasons on my website, not to have given several. We have picked up two. I've, I'll come to it. Because then you have to read in context. These are not the only two reasons. These are two of the many reasons I gave. And one of the reasons I gave that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Ummi, as Allah says in the Quran in Surah an kabut chapter number 29, verse number 48, that we have made the last Prophet as an Ummi, so that the blabberers will not use that as a pretext. You have to agree that between illiterate and illiterate, it is more difficult for illiterate. You have to agree that. Do you agree or not? More difficult. More difficult if a person who is literate, for him to copy is much more easier. He can hear also and read also. For a person who is illiterate, he can only hear. So at least you have to agree with me for sake of argument. It is difficult. Do you agree? Yes, God, mashallah. So these are points I'm mentioning many. This is not the only one point. Amongst the many points, this is one of them. All the others follow. Point number two, you mentioned. I said that no Arabic version of the Bible was present, and I agree with it yet. You quoted Sai Bukhari, volume number six, that Varka, yes, he had knowledge about the gospel. Nowhere does he say that he translated. Brother, I challenge you. I challenge you. According to Christian sources, the first time, the first time the Bible was written was in the 10th century. That means the Christian scholars don't know their homework. The first Arabic version of the Bible came much hundreds of years after Prophet Muhammad. Yes, Waraka coming from the Bani Israel. He had knowledge of the scriptures and knew Arabic. Saying that he has translated it. He may have written some notes, but translated the full Bible, impossible. 
nowhere does Sahi Bukhari say that Varka translated the full Bible. I challenge you. It may say that Varka had knowledge of the law and the gospel. May have written some notes. If, if, if. You know Salman Rajdi's book? Salman Rajdi's book also has verses of the Quran. I can't call it the Quran, but Salman Rajdi wrote a book against the Quran. In that book, there are some verses of the Quran. That does not mean that is the Quran. There are other people like I. I write a book. I mentioned certain verses of the Quran in my book, Quran Modern Science, Similarity Islam Hindu. That book is not the Quran. You cannot say Dr. Zakir Naik translated the Quran. Just because if you go on the website and see, Dr. Zakir Naik wrote a book, Quran Modern Science, and I've quoted about 150 verses. You cannot say that. It is some. And furthermore, you said Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, wrote down and corrected. Okay, that's a very good point. Now, I have given a talk on Bible and Quran in the light of science. And I've proved there are so many scientific errors in the Bible. For example, in the book of Genesis, chapter number one itself, it says that the world was created in 624 days. It says the light of the moon is its own light. Genesis chapter number one, verse number 16 to 19. It says that the sun was created after the earth. Earth was created on third day, sun on the fourth day. I can go on and on. So do you mean to say Prophet Muhammad took this and changed it? The light of the moon is not its own light, it's a reflected light. Quran says in Surah Furqan, chapter 25, verse 61, that the light of the moon is reflected light. Quran says the world was created in six ayam, six long period. So you mean to say Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam picked up all these things and corrected? Do you think he was a scientist? No, it was a revelation from God. So go for my full talk, just quoting part of my talk, and as though like you will say that I will you hear my full talk. And then I said that even if I agree, he copied from the Bible for sake of argument and then corrected. Is it possible for a human being 1400 years back to correct all the scientific errors? Means what is wrong he corrected. It's impossible. Impossible. So this proves that it was not his work. It was the work of the creator, almighty God. Hope that answers the question. Question from the center mic, please. Yes, sir. My name is uh, N. Rav Shekhar or uh, Sridhar Reddy, sir. I'm principal of uh, B.E.D. College. Uh, but I studied uh, different religions, sir, uh, including Bible and Quran, Hadith and all these things. And uh, I've been trying to know truth. And I learned namaz and I was doing. Sir, in one of the Hadiths, uh, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he asks a Syrian not to divulge his uh, faith and say, la ilaha illallah. The times were such. But nowadays, because it is the, the uh, bottle disease, uh, our psychological implications and also social implications and other things are passed. Is there any concession uh, for uh, people who want to follow uh, Islam and also uh, some of the things given by Tao of Physics by Fidget Capra and Stephen Hawking's History of Time. Uh, there are so many galaxies and other things. And we cannot uh, brush aside some of the concepts like Anal Haq or Aham Brahmasmi. Doing five times namaz, or even thousand. Can we, in our uh, rest time, follow this uh, concept of Anal Haq? And uh, as some of the people who are Please telling. pose one question at a time. We have lack of time. And answer your question. The other people waking on the microphone. The brother asked the question that he knows of a hadith that Prophet told a Syrian not to change his faith. Not to? Not to say, la uh, la la allowed in the bazaar. He was beaten. The brother has said that Prophet Muhammad said, don't say la 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 loudly in the bazaar. He was beaten. I don't know which hadith you are quoting in context. There's a hadith which says that don't say Allah Akbar loudly. Not la ilaha illallah. That is a hadith because in the war, when they're hiding and the enemy is coming, don't say Allah Akbar loudly. Because that means you'll be exposed. Not in the bazaar, in the battlefield. The other hadith says say loudly so that it will encourage the other soldiers. So it depends upon the situation. He does one of the person in the battlefield, say Allah Akbar. It gives the jasbah the passion, the love. But certain times when you're hiding, if you say loudly, then you'll be exposed. So depending upon different situations, different things are there. Your main question was? 
that can we follow Islam and other things like Socrates or some other people or from other scientists, including Anwar Haq. As far as following anything else with Islam, if it doesn't go against the Quran and the Sai Hadith, no problem. If it matches with the Quran and Sai Hadith, it should be followed. If anything else, whether X, Y or Z, whether science, geography, history, whether Hinduism, Christianity, Judaism, say something which is also mentioned in the Quran, it becomes the fourth for you to follow. If it says something which is not mentioned in the Quran and does not go against the Quran, you can follow it, muba, optional. But if it says something which is against the Quran, it is haram, it is prohibited. Three different strategies, three different ways. Regarding a question, Islam believes in Tawheed, five times Salah. Does it believe in Anwar Haq? Anwar Haq becoming one with God, it is shirk. It is against Tawheed. You can't say I believe in Tawheed and you believe in more than one God. You believe in Tawheed and saying I will become one with God, it is opposite. So anyone who believes in that becoming one with God, he cannot be a follower of Tawheed, he cannot be Mohail. It's two opposite things. But other things which matches with the Quran, no problem. Which doesn't go against the Quran, no problem. Hope that answers the question. Question from a non-Muslim sister. A pleasure. Good evening to everyone here. I'm V. Lakshmi Ayer. So, I'm a Hindu and truly believe in Islam. I believe in Islam because I have got some proof from it. So, when you said God is one, religion is one, let me take an example of three people, a Hindu, a Muslim and a Christian. Let me take them together and if their bodies if suppose their bodies are cut down, what oozes from their body? Only blood and it's only blood. Not the milk, nor the water, it's only the blood. When you cut down, only the blood oozes. Why do we differentiate when we depart the body? The Muslims go with burying and we Hindus, we go by letting the pyre. The sister says that she appreciates Islam, she believes in Islam and I congratulate you and I welcome you to the faith of Islam. Submitting our will to Almighty God. The question asked by the sisters that a Hindu, Christian and a Muslim all have got the same body, same blood, same constituent. But when we die, why in Hinduism do we burn the body? Why in Islam do we bury? Let's analyze the pros and cons and you decide which is better. In Hinduism, also they say you can bury the children, etc. But when you become an adult, most of the sex safe you have to burn, you have to cremate. There are some sects which say uh, you have to bury. But let's analyze the pros and cons between cremation, that is burning, and burial. If we analyze, in Islam, we have to bury. Why? Because today we have come to know that whatever constituents of the body is there, the earth, the soil, contains the same basic elements of the body in lesser or greater proportion. So from earth we come, and to earth we return. Scientific. Comparison, point number one. In cremation, we burn the body, there is pollution. In Islam, when we bury, the land becomes fertile. There's no pollution, there's no burning. Point number two, when you burn, you chop down the trees. Greenery goes down. Environment is being uprooted. In Islam, when we bury, land becomes fertile, more trees grow. It becomes a manure. No chopping down of the trees. Better for the environment. You know, the government says, don't chop trees. If you don't chop trees, how will you burn the human body? <laughs> Point number three, it is more expensive. According to Indian statistics, every year, crores and crores and crores, hundreds and thousands of crores, every day crores of rupees are spent. Every year, hundreds of crores are being spent only on the trees and burning the body. In Islam, when we bury, it is cheap, free. Point number five, when we burn, the wood becomes charcoal, ashes. In Islam, once we bury in the land, the same land can be used after a few years. It is forever. You can recycle it. The same land, after a few years, when the bones get disintegrated, you can recycle. So logically and scientifically, if we analyze, it is more scientific, more humane, more better for burial as compared for cremation. Hope that answers the question, sister. 
Yes, brother. Please announce your name first. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Mayur. Uh, I have to ask a question on behalf of my non-Muslim friend. It's not my question. He's feeling shy to come on mic. So can I go ahead? Well, what is your name, you said? Mayur. Mayur. I am a revert, but it's a question on behalf of my non-Muslim friend. He doesn't want to come on mic. So if yes, you allow. Sir. OK. Assalamu alaikum to all of you. Uh, his question is, all the prophecies that uh, Zakir Bhai quoted, uh, is it possible that these prophecies were being edited later on in all the various scriptures of the world to uh, uh, preach Islam in a uh, other way? So, the brother asked a good question. Can it be possible that all these prophecies were added in all these scriptures later on? Can it be? Yes, it can be. If it is not added, if the scripture is pure, you have to believe it to be the word of God. You have to follow Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If you say it is added, that means your scripture is corrupted. You leave your scripture aside. So if you leave your scripture aside, the only pure scripture is the Quran. Both ways you come to the Quran, head thy win, tails you lose. Question from the center mic, please. Okay, good evening. I have one question. Before that, my name is Mr. Ram Ramesh Kumar. I am from Mayapul. My profession is pastor. So brother, uh, in this occasion, you are told the final is Quran. OK, but uh, I have one question. In a bottle of Yamama, my people died. These who by the Quran, there was a few that Quran can be lost during the Abu Bakr time. And second, uh, Sayyid al-Bukhari, volume 6, hadith number 510 says, but when three caliphs, uh, third caliphs came, he was fighting with Harimiya people. And that time, this uh, found all the way reading a different Qurans. So, Usman written. And another thing is, uh, Allah says in Quran 15, 9, says we, uh, we have released and we got it. But here, the Quran was born. And at the time, what was the corrupted? Why it was the corrupted? Where it was the corrupted? Who is what the co corrupted? When it was the corrupted? Please answer me. Those asked the question. He says, when the Quran says in Surah Hijar, chapter 15, verse number 9, which I quoted in my talk, that we have revealed the Quran and we shall guard from corruption. So when the Quran says the Quran is uncorrupted, Allah says it's unadulterated. How come Sai Bukhari says that the Quran was lost at Abu Bakr's time, and third Khalifa Hazrat Usman came, and he found different readings, and then how is it possible? Brother, what you said of Sai Bukhari is correct. What Hazrat Usman, may Allah be peace with him, found is variant reading. For example, in English language, there are different dialects. Same English language, a South Indian speaks different. What is your name? An Englishman, what is your name? So Hyderabadi has a different accent. I can't imitate it. <laughs> Hindi style is different. My wife was telling me, why don't you speak Hyderabadi style Urdu yesterday? Nako. <laughs> In Bombay, we don't say Nako. In Bombay, we say Ainga, Jainga, Khainga, Pienga. So one of my Bombay brothers said, Ainga, Gainga was this yesterday. So here you realize that every area has a different dialect. So same way at the time of Hazrat Usman, in Arabic, may Allah be pleased with him, there were different dialects. What the Prophet gave permission was seven dialects. So in pronunciation, they made mistakes. So when they made mistakes, he said, OK, let's finalize it. And we have to follow the correct pronunciation. So one of the reasons he did was he corrected the dialect. If someone says, what is your name? An Englishman will say, what type of English is this? What is your name? What's your name? American accent is different. British accent is different. Neutral accent is different. Some are accepted, some are not. This was one of the reasons. He corrected the dialect. Number two, when Prophet Muhammad when the Quran was revealed, he had special scribes. And he told the special sahabas, whatever was revealed to him, he repeated it. And the sahabas wrote down, he rejected. In that, Zayed bin Thabit, may Allah be peace with him, he was the main person, and other scribes. Now, many of the Sahabas, when Prophet Muhammad said the Quran, they went home and wrote it through memory. So now someone hears my speech, 
and goes home and makes points. It may be right, may be wrong. It will not be verbatim. But if I tell someone and check up, OK, I'm giving notes, write this, read it again. It's a mistake, correct it. So the copy that was kept with Mama Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was verified by him when he was alive. It was given to his wife, Hazrat Hafsa, may Allah be pleased with her, who was the daughter of Hazrat Umar. May Allah be pleased with him. So it was kept in that custody. Now when people wrote on their own, from their memory, there are bound to be mistakes. So the Quran is not wrong. Even though there were notes of some people, Hazrat Usman said, now people should not get misled that that is the real Quran. So he said, okay, now I'll make copies of this and spread it throughout different parts of the world so that they will know this is the authentic. The Quran wasn't changed. People, when they had their own notes written down, people did not know whether that was 100% verbatim correct or not. So Hazrat Usman, the third Khalifa, may Allah be pleased with him, he saw to it that he made a committee of the Sahabas and copied it from the original copy and spread it in different parts of the world. And one of them is even present in Tashkent in Koptaki Museum today. And if you analyze it, it is verbatim same. And today the Huffas, even if you burn all the copies, today there are millions of Huffas who know the Quran by heart. Even if you burn all the copies, hypothetically, yet if these people get together, they can again make the true verbatim Quran. Hope that answers the question. Any non-Muslim sister? Good evening to everybody. I'm Mrs. Sutapa Sarka. I'm a teacher by profession. With due respect, sir, I wish to ask you a question. How is karma and moksha defined in Islam? And how is it indifferent while in practice? Sister, there's a question that how is karma and moksha defined in Islam? Karma, sister, in the Hindu scriptures means deed. The deed that you do action, it should be followed according to dharma. And the Hindu scholars, they believe in a philosophy known as samskara, the cycle of birth, death, birth, and death, known as reincarnation, or the theory of transmigration of soul. And they believe that whatever karma you do, if you do good deeds, in the next life you'll be born of a higher level. If you do bad deeds, in the next life, you'll be born of a lower level. If you do good deeds, you'll be born like a human being. If bad deeds, maybe like an animal, like a rat, like a cat, or like a cockroach. And only if there are no things, there are no balance of good or bad, then you get moksha from the cycle of samskara, birth, and death. This is the philosophy of the Hindu scholars. But this is nowhere mentioned in the Veda, is nowhere mentioned in the Vedas, the highest authorities. They do try and derive it from Bhagavad Gita, which is mentioned in Bhagavad Gita, chapter number 2, verse number 22, that like a body changes clothes and puts on new clothes, same way a soul puts on a new body. In the Hindu scriptures, there is a mention of Punar Janam in the Vedas. Book number 10, hymn number 16, verse number 4, 5. Punar means next, Janam means life. Next life. We believe in next life. We believe we came in this world once. We'll only come once. We were alive before. Allah called us to die. We came in this world. Again we'll die. Again we'll be resurrected in the next world. So we believe in this world. Islam believe will come once. And then we'll be resurrected, raised up alive in the next year after. Depending upon a good and bad deeds, you'll go to hell or heaven. Swarga Narak. This is what the Vedas say. But they could not realize, the Hindu scholars, that how come some people are born deaf, some people blind, some people poor, some people rich, some people healthy. So God cannot do injustice. So they came up with this philosophy of cycle of birth, death, birth, death, transmigration of soul, which is nowhere mentioned in the Veda. Even Bhagavad Gita, when it says, you throw away your old clothes and put new clothes, same way the soul throws away the body and puts a new body, once I've got no objection. Once you die, again you're resurrected. But Islam has a reply for the query. Because the Hindu scholars could not agree that how can God be unjust? Some people born deaf, some people healthy, some people with heart disease, some people rich, some people poor. Islam believes, Allah says in Surah Mul, chapter number 16, verse number 2, Allah zi khalaq al wal hayata. It is Allah who has given death and life to test which of you is good indeed. 
So this life is a test for the hereafter. Now some people are born rich, some people are born poor. The rich people, the Quran says, you have to give zakat. Whatever saving you have, more than the 85 grams of gold, more than nisab, 2.5% zakat, every lunar you have to give. The rich person may give, may not give. He may give half. He may get 100% marks, may get 50%. If he doesn't give, he'll get zero. For the poor man, he doesn't have to give zakat. He gets 100 out of 100 in zakat. We tere garib insane. Garib kya usko 100 out of 100 mila zakat mein. In zakat, therefore Prophet said, it is easier for a poor man to go to Jannah than a rich man. The rich man will say, oh, I don't have to give so much zakat. I may have to give, I may not have to give. If he's the best, maximum will get 100 out of 100. For the poor man, already full marks. So everyone is tested in different ways. Some people are born healthy, some people are born with congenital heart defects. We don't believe he's born with a disease because he's sinned in the last life. It's a test for the hereafter. Not that he has sinned. Maybe it's a test for the parents. Allah says in Surah Anfal, chapter number 8, verse number 28, your wealth and your children are a test for you. Maybe Allah wants to test the parents. They are very pious. And he gives birth to children who have congenital heart disease. Someone will say, oh, I don't believe in God. Those are very good parents may say, yet I believe in God. Allah is testing. The greater the test, the higher is the reward. Maybe Allah wants to give them jannat e firdaus Like if you pass a graduation, you get a BA or a BSc or a BCom. If you pass MBBS, you get doctor. Difficult to pass MBBS than normal BA. But difficult the test, higher the degree. So we believe no one is born sinful. Everyone is born masum. But in the Hindu philosophy, of the scholars, not of the scripture, they believe that you come in this world again and again, if you do good deeds as a human being, bad deeds as a low being, this the Vedas never believe. And furthermore, logically, if you analyze today, sister, the crime is increasing or decreasing? Increasing or decreasing? Crime is increasing or decreasing? Increasing. Is the population of human beings increasing or decreasing? Increasing. So logically, if the crime is increasing, the human population should decrease. It is not. So that proves that this philosophy is wrong. And furthermore, refer to my video cassette, similarities between Hinduism and Islam, for more details on the subject. Since we are coming to the close, I would request one short question, and I would request the speaker also to give a short reply. Please come. My profession is training in yoga and public speaking skills. I am Chandra Kumar. Yeah, good evening, my dear soul friend, Jake Naik. Just one thing. Uh, I am basically Hindu, and uh, I am, have equal respect for all other systems also. And I could learn some techniques of Christianity and Islam from my father also. Fine. So I would like to know from you. And uh, in other systems, all are not universal, only for particular community and particular segment. Islam, but the Quran is for, you are telling us, uh, Surya Subha 24, 28, some difference for universal thing. Fine. The crisp of the Vedic, I mean, to the best of my knowledge, it is Sarve Janaha Sukhino Bhavantu. Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinaha, it says. But it doesn't say Sarve Hindu Sukhinaha, Sarve Hindu Sukhinaha. No, it is all the human beings should be merciful, happy, and pleasant. It is one thing. And another thing, Whatever the, uh, you are describing for Allah in Surya Iqlas, Kulluhu Wallahu Ahad Allahu Samallam Melel Walam Yulad Walam Yekullahu Kufuvan Nahad. Like that, in our Vedas also, verses 24 to 28, Samadhipata of Yoga, it is describing Klesa Karma Vipaka Asayahi Abaram Rushnaha Purusha Viseshaha Yeswaraha Tatra Nirati Sayam Sarvajna Bijam Sarvesham Api Guru Kale Narva Chedat Tasya Vachakaha Pranavaha. He has not given to any birth to not any person, he was not born to any person. And he is superior to even five basic elements. And he is at all the times omnipresent. That is Ishwara. Whatever the Allah, you have given, it is appealing to the same Ishwara what we call. And in Bhagavad Gita, since you know, Sloka 31 of chapter 3, I mean, uh, Karma Yoga, it says, Yete matamidam, Yete matamidam, for manavaha, Shraddhavayo, Anasuyatom, Muchente api karma bihi. What he says, whoever follows my religion, all the human beings, Lord Krishna says, not only the Hindus who follow, all the human beings who follow my words of Bhagavad Gita, I am with them. 
that is the thing. And to the best of my mind, I don't know that Sura, you say. We are getting late. You already asked three questions already. Please. You have asked one question. The police is saying the time is up. We have to respect the law. Otherwise, they say, I'm not a good Muslim. I got the chit. They have to end by 10.30. 10.30 is already up. I'll just try and reply in brief. All these questions are answered on the website. You can go to my video cassettes. I'll give you a copy of Similarity with Islam and Hinduism. The brother said, I'll answer in short for more details. Refer to my other cassettes. The brother said that even Hinduism says that Sukh for all of humanity. Brother, I said that whenever the scriptures came, it came for that time and for those people. That means Sukh for whole of humanity of that time. Of that time. Not till eternity. Otherwise, your Hindu scripture wouldn't have said there is a Rishi to come. If everything was mentioned in the Vedas, why will the Vedas say Antim Rishi will come for what? If the Veda has mentioned all the truth, why will they say one more Rishi going to come for what? So this proves that the Veda did say about human being, but for that time. It doesn't say it for the whole of humanity forever. So all the scriptures, when they say another Rishi is going to come, that means he is going to come to say something else. In the Quran it says Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the last messenger. After him, no one will come. If anyone says, I get a wahi, I get a revelation, today he requires a psychiatrist. Messengership is over. Coming to your other question, you said that your Veda is your second and third question. Your Veda said God is one, you should not worship him, etc. I agree with it. That's what I said, Kulwala was. So what is the question? But do you worship such a God? You said you believe in Kulwala was, God is one, who is not begotten, who has got no image, there is nothing like him. So I am asking you, yes, I believe in that. Do you believe in such a God? So the moment you give an idol to God, that means it is going against your Veda. And as I mentioned earlier, it's clearly mentioned in the Sveta Satar Upanishad, chapter number 4, verse number 19, and Rajur by chapter number 32, verse number 3, Nartasya Patima Asti, of that God, there is no Pratima, there is no statue, there is no idol, there is no image, there is no photograph, there is no sculpture. You believe this and worship such a God, like the four criteria of Surah class, then you are worshipping the true God, otherwise it's a false God. Hope that answers the question. Wa akhiru dawana, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen. Salam, salam, salam.